Thank you. I appreciate all this. Uh, over Yeah, there you go. So this is what people will be seeing on you. If I need it. Oh yeah, Spanish sweets and everything are there. You can have. Yeah, I bought uh, her here. <laughs> nice. I feel I feel so honored. Thank you. I feel so honored. Thank you. <laughs> Special in invited. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. I cannot see. What is the thing? I cannot see. Uh, I think it's No, no, no. It's, so I'm sharing this. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Just go to. Yeah. Oh, here. Uh, right now. Within controls, right? Yeah, that's the one. And then oh, oh okay. okay. And I'm going to give you now permissions, right? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, you, you should be co-host now. Shalik will be online. I asked him to come. Yeah. <laughs> It shows us uh, tactic. It shows us recording now. It is recording. Okay. I cannot see. Yeah. I think it says already recording. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, recording. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, so I guess if you are ready, you can start with us. Is Shani online? I think so. A brother, you can can you hear me? A brother. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. yes, I'm online. Is it is okay? It's good. audible. Okay. Can you hear well? Can you also hear me or not? Yes, I can hear you as well. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good, good. <clears throat> okay, should we start with I think so, yeah. Yeah, it's it's recording and all. Yeah, I don't the thing is, let me see if I can put this. Your 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 picture for one hour is that uh my picture it is, yeah. You can see and my picture is is that is that camera as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you don't need that. What is the point in having? Just think of when they yeah. make yeah. questions. So, no? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's an image of us in the US. Okay, should we start then? Yeah, let's go. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. 
Welcome everybody, uh, including those people who are still having food, um, to uh, his defense of Alberto Olmo Fernandez today. He'll be defending his dissertation titled uh, Analyzing Failure Modes of Inscrutable Machine Learning Models. Uh, his committee is Professor Wandu and Professor Larson Lee and the doctors Shailik and Gupta, uh, Bashir and Shailik are on, uh, on Zoom and I'm the chair. Um, before we get started with the Parliament's proceedings, I'd like to say just a few words about Alberta. Alberta started his PhD in fall 2018. Prior to that, he completed his master's in the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, and his bachelor's at University of Anama in Barcelona. Um, once he got admitted to ASU with financial aid, etc., he apparently asked Pamela Dunn uh, who he should work with. And Pam said, go work with Rao, probably so she can keep an eye on him from across the office. Um, so that's how we got uh, him with our lab. Uh, so um, during his time at ASU, Alberto has been involved in a variety of projects and collaborated with several lab mates. Uh, uh, some of them are here, including Sharat and Niharika, who showed up, uh, Lydia, who is in um, in um, RPI, uh, Shai of course, also was involved in some work that was done uh, with, uh, uh, with Alberto uh, and Karthi, and uh, of course, Yantian, who we used to call Chantian. I don't know why. Yeah. Uh, What's the, uh, um, the work he did related to understanding failure models in large machine learning models is what he will describe um, in a minute. That's his, like the bulk of his PhD, what he's involved in other things. Upon successful completion of his meetings, Alberto plans to Start with why started YML uh, as an ML ops engineer. Um, in addition to his research, Alberto was also involved as a TA for some of my courses. In those roles, Alberto is a fierce advocate for the poor students' interests. I mean, it's like bleeding hard when we say, you know, let's have extra hope. But we didn't tell them that they <laughs> So, so any of you who are in my classes and Alberto, and if you had slightly more breathing time, it's because he was uh, arguing your case. Um, he's also been involved in um, working with and mentoring undergrad students. Um, I don't quite remember whether Niharika was already like uh, in master's or not, but Niharika and also with Dennis Lu, I don't know whether he's around, um, he worked with them. Uh, in general, when undergrad students will ask me uh, their opportunities, I'll send a mail to Yochan, uh, my, my, lab, my lab thing, and then he would be one of the people who say, no, I'll, I'll talk to them. Alberto is known for his uh, athleticism, as you can see, he's in a much better shape than I am, as well as oh his God. strict diet habits. And that's not exactly what you think it might mean. For a while, he would avoid our group lunches, as he felt that the portions were too small. <laughs> not too bad, too small. When he eats, he eats healthily, and then he stops eating, apparently. That's how he keeps his lunch bigger. Um, he's one of the few people who would actually come to school early in the day. He actually sleeps at the right time and wakes up at the right time, and, and be there by the time I showed up, unlike the rest of my lab who <laughs> believe that the time starts at 12 noon and afterwards. Um, as you can tell from the authentic tapas bar um, <laughs> with the Catalonian samosas that we set up there, uh, Alberto is a Spaniard and uh, the token European in our group. Um, and he's been, because of that, he's been often the uh, brunt of all the Yankee Euro skepticism. You keep asking him about all these great Googles and Amazons that Spain has started. Yeah. Um, he gamely pushed back and he's tried his best to instill in all of us a sense of good living and a respect for the weekends. That's extremely important. I think I remember he wrote to Shailene, oh, yeah. don't come on the weekends. You know, and I think I think actually took that when he not only did he not come in the weekends, he also makes sure that Shailene won't come. Uh, <laughs> seriously, uh, it was great having um, um, Alberto in our lab. And he defends successfully, we'll certainly miss that enlightened Euro viewpoint. Take it away. <laughs> Thank Welcome. you so much. Thank you, Dr. Rao. Thank you. Okay, well, after this nice introduction, uh, let's see. So, today, yeah, I'm going to present today my thesis defense. Um, uh, 
you, you have co-host, co right? You can ask, okay, please. Um, yeah, so basically, well, my, my thesis defense, the title is analyzing failure mode, so machine learning, machine learning models. This work has been done uh, in Dr. Lau's lab, at the, the Johnson lab. And yeah, I'll start right away. So the idea here basically first is that um, we have that failure modes are right now, uh, are still there very present in machine learning. Uh, the idea here in, in this work, I want to separate basically in two. Um, can you, can you oh, one quick question about, are you sharing right. slides on Zoom? What? Are you gonna see them? No, I can't see the slides. On oh, I'm Zoom. sorry. Oh, nice. Thank you for, thank you for telling me. Yeah, I guess. Oh, nice, nice. Okay, thank you for telling me. Yeah, I'm gonna start sharing the. Yes. Can you see them now? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, Tricky. I was thinking what happened to the phone. I see. Oh, yeah. That's okay. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So, the overall idea here is that um, there are there exist these failure modes in machine learning that has always been there. And it is uh, in this work, I'm tackling mostly from two main perspectives uh, the, uh, how to, on how to approach them. Um, the problem of uh, failure modes in machine learning is well, they are kind of obvious, but they can uh, they can extend pro, uh, biases in any in any from any machine learning from any, from any data sets. Uh, this can lead to a uh, loss of trust in the system itself, and also this may kind of like if, if you have the uh, at the end of the the line you can have that for high stakes scenarios it is uh, it, it may be still unreliable to to deploy like for example uh, medical. Uh, uh, medical scenarios. Um, there, are, there are these two examples, the gender shades uh, example, which I'm giving here, which is uh, basically they, they gather a series of faces from European and North American countries and they, and they put them into the current uh, state-of-the-art classifier, face classifier methods that they have. And they show that these methods were working much better for uh, white males than for, for example, the, the other counterpart, which would be black or, or non white female. Um, so, those are kind of, that's one of the problems of, uh, that can arise from there. As well as uh, we can also have some inexplicability in our classification. So, as I mentioned, this, is, this comes from the fact that uh, currently we are mostly focused on, on scoreboards and making uh, machine learning models more, uh, always better, I think, from uh, improving metrics like uh, accuracy, F1, which are metrics that do not account for any of these uh, biases inside or like any, uh, any, any explicability at all. So um, as you can see in this graph that I have here right now and the deep learning or neural networks, which are the, the main, the main, uh, the main um, uh, topic or the main, the main uh, algorithm that we are using uh, for AI right now, it's at the very high, uh, spectrum in terms of accuracy, but in terms of explainability of itself, it's there's, there's still a long way to go there. So my work will focus now mostly on showing that these that large learn models or large neural networks are indeed um, suffer from some unexpected failure modes and also uh, um, make uh, can be can be worse seen. I mean, can be sometimes not very. Uh, Good to use for some high stakes scenarios. So in this work, um, I focus on these three points here, which are basically all first and large image classifiers, uh, showing how the mixed classifications, the type of mixed classifications that they can have, then on generative adversarial networks and how they bias, they, they not only um, they not only continue the, the bias in the original distribution of the, of the data they are trained on, but even exacerbate it. And finally, I will show uh, on, on LLMs how, like GPT-3, how these, uh, how they are still not ready for for reason, even though people are uh, claiming otherwise. So um, I have separated this into two main categories. The, on the left side, uh, these are it's my a more proactive approach, saying that uh, you know, on this 
large image classifiers, we also try to uh, improve the classification itself. I'll go into details now. Uh, while on the other two kind of works that, that I'm doing, um, we are more of probing or showing that there exist biases and they are, and these works are, are working. Um, these failure modes are happening and they, we show them basically. So it's more from an evaluative perspective, so I have to say. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah perfect. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, first of all, I'll start with the analyzing how, how I analyze the failure modes in large image classifiers. Um, the main idea here is uh, so we have large image classifiers that we use to, um, to, to predict uh, any kind of, of imagery there. So, however, we are now fo currently focusing mostly, as I said, in just accuracy metrics and metrics that just measure uh, their effectiveness while not measuring any kind of uh, misclassification importance. So, um, unless they are 100% accurate, these models will always fail. And when they fail, we better have misclassifications that are more explicable uh, for humans. So, for example, uh, like here we can see like this cat, for example, on the original, uh, on the original model, they were claiming that it was a remote control. While uh, we can see the small alpha cat, uh, the, the origin, the, sorry, the ground truth was that it was a tabby, which is a kind of fact, cat. And after our work, we showed that it was moving more towards like in this case a tiger cat, which is still a misclassification, but is much closer to the original. So that's an example of what we are doing. So. In order to capture, we first need to capture the, how, like the importance or how the human feel, how the, the, the explicability for the human itself, like what is the explicability in the human's mind. We can do that from three types of, of uh, on three types of um, three ways, from more task, task specific to more generic, where we first do at the, at the instance level, at this instance level, meaning that each and every human gets all of the images in the data set and they, they, label, them, uh, they label, it, label them manually, meaning that in the end, we, get, we will get like an average distribution for every image and for, for the class itself. And with that, we will get uh, finally what we are looking for, which is a confusion matrix of the human over the, the task. This is the most, uh, the, this has the finest granularity, but it has, it is of course the most expensive to do. And it really does not scale anywhere around. In terms of the, we then make it so that this is a little bit more uh, it scales to scale better at the at the class level semantic, where instead of giving one by one image to the, for the humans to classify, what we do now is uh, give the class itself the name of the class itself, and ask them to from a zero to four score how how far they are to any of the other classes. This scales quite quadratically, so it's still not um, uh, it's still very expensive, but at least way less expensive at the other at the other. And finally, in order to get rid of all of this um, uh, of human intervention, we can use also as well like expert uh, knowledge level, which are, for example, ontologies like WordNet, or now other other works like LLMs could also be used. However, as I show later, they are already biased, so. Yeah, and at, using at, at the expert knowledge level, we can read of we can get rid of the of the, of the human intervention and in the scale better. So now the idea is that with those previous uh, with those previous models or, or or ways of getting the human mental model, now we can embed them into the into the loss function, and we do so with what is called the weighted loss function, which is basically having a term or every time that the, that, the, that the classifier itself is wrong, we, we penalize it with a, a weighted term. In this case, this weighted term comes from the confusion matrix that, that we have gathered before. Um, then we also have a couple of, uh, of explicability metrics um, uh, that are basically the hard, hard, we call them hard and soft scores, where hard score would be comparing all of the classifiers from, uh, the top one, the one that has done the best on the, on the in terms of explicability, the, in terms of which one of the, the, the classifiers was closest to the actual 
to the actual class than the rest. While the soft one allows, instead of being top one, it, al it allows for some uh, slack there, and you can have uh, the we divide by the amount of, of ones that got it correct. Um, so now, when we want to, if we want to analyze or what we want to experiment with this, we also want that the, the classifiers make the most misclassifications in order to to know how well uh, they are making after training. Because um, we, the way that we embed it with the weighted loss functions is by retraining. We don't need to sorry refining. Not we don't need to retrain train from the beginning. So uh, now we use out of this what is called out of distribution data sets in this case are the ones in blue uh, cfr 10 plus uh, cfr 100 plus and imagine at cfr 10 um, and then we use three models we already pre-trained pre -trained models the resnav 2 vg16 and inception 2 and for the, la the latter two vg16 and inception 2 we only use an expert the expert knowledge level uh, confusion matrix because they contain more than 100 classes each and getting the, the human table uh, or human intervention would not be, uh, would not be, we couldn't, couldn't be done. Uh, on the other side, for, for Resident Evil 2, we did, given that there are only 10 classes, we could gather all of them for the, at the instance level, class level, and expert level. So, so now we can have um, the, the evaluations themselves, which are going to be uh, on, four, on four dimensions. Uh, we evaluate the cost. Of getting of training or getting the, the confusion metrics in this case, the how the explicability based on 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 the on the soft hard scores and sort of these internal scores and external evaluation from humans, and the in terms of fu functionality of in terms of uh, top one accuracy, and finally we also check how they look at light in terms of the, a saliency saliency method saliency method for that. In terms of the human experiments um, that we did here, after retraining our models and after having them ready, we get a batch of 50 images to, and send it to 52, 52 images and send it to 50 MTARs. Uh, and then let them choose, let them give us their opinion on what their, the, the most explicable misclassification is. So uh, as an example, what the, the image on the, on the left side will have two misclassifications. One is given by our model, our, our model, our retrain model. The other one is given by the original or the vanilla model. And we let the human tell us uh, what is the explicability for both misclassifications. And the same for, even though this is a small image, it's for Super 10 plus, we do so for, for them as well. Uh, then now in, in terms of the results here, we have that uh, for CFR 10 plus and ImageNet, uh, where we train with the ResNet V2 model. We show that uh, we have comparable, somewhat comparable, um, um, somewhat comparable accuracy, while it drops around, depending on the on the model that we use to, to retrain, it drops. It can drop up to like 44, sorry, up to, up to like four points. But we show that, uh, Indeed, it improves explicability in terms of the, the, this internal evaluation metrics by between 10 and 20%. Um, then for CIFAR 100, we find that, and CIFAR 100 and VGG 16, we find that uh, in, this, in this case, uh, it, it manages to, to keep the, the same accuracy, even improving slightly on, on the CIFAR 100 side, while still even improving on the, on the hard and, and our hard and soft scores, which also was good. Then, um, then for the ImageNet case, we also find that the, the, the accuracy did not drop much, and we still we also, uh, that the explicability also went up. Finally, for the human evaluation ratings, we find that uh, for both ImageNet and CIFAR 10 plus, our, all of our methods that we, that we gave to humans are at least at, are, at uh, maximum two times better in terms of explicability than the, than the original model. So we can take from here that our method seems to work best for our distribution data set. And while dropping uh, at least for, for the latter models that I've shown, uh, not as much accuracy. Uh,
finally, for this work, we also wanted to see like where the, the model after being retrained, where is it looking at, basically, where, where the gradients are looking at in the image, what is the most important part of the image in order to make that classification. And we find some interesting, um, we, we get some interesting findings like, uh, well, the, that, that, like, for example, focusing that it focuses for some images, it focuses more on the actual object other than, than, than on the surrounding sort of. But for, to make final claims on this, uh, more, there should be more, uh, it's more extensive study for this. Now, um, now I'm gonna move to the next um, failure mode analyzation that I do in this work. This is about, uh, and I'm, well, I'm gonna uh, show you now what is it about. Um, so the idea is that now we have, even though they have been already, uh, uh, there are more, there are better state-of-the-art works right now, Generative adversarial networks are a type of neural networks that are used to make um, new data when you have your own, um, say you have your own data set and you want to expand your data. Generative adversarial networks have been useful in that sense because they generate new, seemingly never before seen data points from the, from the distribution. However, uh, well, they are very popular. However, we wanted to, with this work, we wanted to spell um, uh, practitioners that they can still be, um, they, 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 there are some problems that they have to be aware, especially when the, the distribution that the, the generative adversarial networks are trained is skewed, as I will show now. Um, so previously, there was some work showing indeed that, the, that there was this problem called mode collapse, which made the, 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 which made the, the generation uh, that, that was already a problem for for genetic adversarial networks, but none of the work showed how that can how that can uh, affect when you are training with a skewed and a skewed data set. So we in this work we hypothesize that it not only perpetu I mean the, the idea of a genetic adversarial network is just to uh, uh, continue with the distribution of the data that you are that you have. So if the distribution is biased, you will be you will have your output distribution biased too. But we also want to point out that we not that not only that happens, but can only be um, um, exacerbated in terms of the biases. So, as a very quick uh, overview, a generative adversarial network then is just a tandem of two neural networks working together, where there is a discriminator that tells you uh, that tells what, what is the the, uh, the the actual image versus versus the one that the generator is trying to, is making to, in order to try to pull the discriminator. On the other hand, the, the generator itself is, uh, uh, what is from, it gets from, from random noise, it gets the information to generate images in order to pull the, the, the discriminator, and that's how the whole system improves in order to give uh, better uh, output, um, uh, new unseen images. An example is for what you can see on the right. This is one of our distributions generated out of one of the the, the, the GANs that I'm going to comment now, and it was trained on professors, on engineering professors of of 47 universities, U.S. universities, and uh, as a in a quick glance, we can already see that it's already quite biased towards uh, towards male um, white males. So yeah, so we wanted to we gather also this this data set in order to show our point that for, for, the, for a skewed distributions, it's, it's, it's even worse. So the idea is that I will quickly cover the idea of what is mode collapse in this case. In this case uh, the distribution of data may have different modes in it and uh, they will not always be at the same, at the same, uh, they will not always be um, the, the, as dense each other to each other. So there may be modes that are greater than others, and that is what it makes the the at training time. It makes the the the, the, the GAN focus more initially on those on those major modes, giving more gradients to the major modes, uh, and then the feedback loop would be like the the generator will improve more on those modes that are the the largest, which makes the exacerbation worse. You can have uh, what is called, uh, you can have it full or partial, full meaning that the generator collapsed completely and, uh, and only gives one type of image, or you can have it partial where 
even though there may be more classes in the or may, or other types of, of features in the in the data set, it only it only outputs just a, a hand. So we evaluate this uh, over five types of guns. Four of them are unconditional, meaning uh, they, they generate from random noise. Uh, the fifth one over our, over uh, our is conditional, which means that it gets uh, from a, an original um, uh, image. And then three of them, uh, gun program, Nadagan, are aimed at tackling multiple apps. So we also wanted to check how how this will do. <clears throat> now, in order to evaluate this, we, as I said, we gather professor images and uh, from 47 US universities. And like the, the, it's like 17, we, we got like 17,000 professor images. We put them, the pipeline is very simple. We just put them into the, the GANs and then we get the distribution. And finally, I'll put the, we, we count, I will show now how we count the, the distributions, uh, the output distributions. Um, so originally, as we can see here, the, um, the, the proportion of, of, of gender and the skin color was very skewed towards male with 80% and female 20 and non-white and white with 76 for white and, and 24 for, for, that's the original distribution. Now, after training and, uh, and counting, also with a mechanical chart, uh, what is the new distribution of the of this generated of these GANs? We can see that especially that this GAN, this GAN, uh, pro -GAN, uh, sorry, this GAN and Adagan, both of them are skewed even more significantly, uh, significantly at least towards more uh, uh, the distribution. They skew it even further, while pro -GAN only does on the non-white uh, version. Uh, inclusive GAN on the other side, which also was tackling multiple apps that better, uh, but uh, but I'll show later that it also comes at uh, at a price basically. Um, yeah. So now we also wanted to be, because given that these images that were produced were given to humans, we were limited by the amount of people that could use them. So we other we also use this. Um, uh, MS API, which is uh, an API by Microsoft, that it's, it can automatically run and and, and read the, the I mean and, and classify the gender of uh, people of the images that you give, and we do so for fifteen thousand of such images for <coughs> each of the each of the GANs that we evaluate, and once again we show that this GAN and other GAN are are indeed uh, are indeed skewing more the distribution while. Uh, for feminine, for the gender side, and while program still uh, um, does not, which is in accordance to our previous uh, conclusions. And now we also measure the uh, the confidence, the confidence in the in the evaluation, which is uh, where, in general, so the, the here the idea is that the more variation that is from on the x-axis, the the more the less co uh, confident the, the human. Are. And it shows that it also proves that ProGAN, which is um, the ProGAN and inclusive GAN, at least on the, um, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, ProGAN and inclusive GAN, which are the ones that generate the, the best samples and probably the ones that are also doing the, the best towards uh, minority modes uh, are, are being the ones that have the, the higher confidence metrics. In terms of inclusive GAN, as I mentioned, they were working, it was working better because it, it allows for the way it works is by training or by, by making sure that each, each data point in the data set gets projected when uh, the new generation, uh, the new generation of the of data is, is created. But this comes at the expense of also being very prone, as I, as I showed there, to what is called poison uh, attacks where where you can by just adding a very minuscule amount of, of different types of uh, of images, say uh, in this case of trees, for example, or cats or whatever, to a to a to a data set of of uh, professors, it will be enough to skew the distribution. Already. So it makes uh, not the skew distribution, but make them um, um, well increase. Yeah, indeed, increase the, the distribution in terms of this uh, um, less. Uh, 
harmful uh, uh, classes. So the, also we also show that there is a much lack of diversity than the other ones, like because there are some cases in which they the can just repeats itself. And so it is also not a, a good uh, yeah to to use in that sense. Finally, I go to uh, the conditional GANs in this case, where cycle GAN was the most uh, one that is used the most. In this case, uh, you give uh, the input image, uh, an input image, and it will convert it. Uh, it will convert it to uh, to uh, some, or it will generate some output image. In this case, in this case, what we were doing is changing the. the, the so we were giving it as input a random person or random. Uh, celebrity and we wanted to like make it more engineer professor like because it was trained on engineering professors and we can see that some of the things that happened here is that some glasses are input like uh, some glasses happen or but other things like changing the, the the gender from female to male for example also happen so uh, so <clears throat> this is also the big thing basically that uh, they are gathering these biases and putting them forward. Um, finally, uh, also another problem with, uh, when, when this cycle gun, we believe cycle gun was used for, for the specific from, for one filter of uh, Snapchat, this, this application, uh, smartphone application, where it was, now you get the image and it beautifies you, so as to say. So uh, in the beautification, we show that indeed it's, it, it thinks that beautifying means making whiter faces, uh, for example, and uh, and we show that by by it, we show that indeed it lightens uh, for for uh, significantly for significantly more for 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 people of color than for people that, that are that are white. This is also a concerning. Uh, finally, I want to add here that uh, even though Gans. Uh, where the state of the art now we have new, uh, new state of the art works like large learned models and large language models, where basically you can just by giving it's a text to image generation, so you can just give a, a, a prompt and this um, this will generate the images themselves. And as we can see, for example, they are no less biased already, or no less prone to biases than as we've seen before. In this case, they are like engineering professors. They are all white people, uh, white men, sorry. If, if you ask for kindergarten teachers, they were, um, they, they only generate uh, 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 women. So they are still also. Uh, uh, and that brings me, okay. And so the key takeaways from this work is that, uh, well, even though GANs, uh, GANs that suffer from mode collapse will of course exacerbate biases, then for those that aim to tackle mode collapse, none, none of them have proven to work 100%. Like they haven't shown that the distribution is not exacerbated. And, and as I showed in the previous slide, other large language uh, or large learned models are still prone to these uh, biases as well. So we have to take it this in mind. And this brings me to the um, my final topic in this case, where I analyze uh, large language models. In this case, I do so in uh, in two ways, or in two uh, and two type categories. One of them is for uh, structured data, where the idea is to use natural uh, text and extract. Uh, I want to analyze. I, an, I analyze how they how we extract information from this data from this natural text uh, data. While on the other hand, I also we also analyze um, um, on a on a more reasoning side uh, the outputs of the LLMs in terms of actions, planning action, actions. Also. So, <clears throat> in terms of the structure, the first option uh, in terms of the structure data, we have that. Uh, so the idea behind this is that we have you have a text you want to extract, for example. The actions from the text. You can, uh, there are these are very large uh, amount of task specific approaches that do so already. So uh, the, the output, if you, when you give a text like this, the output will be just the actions and 
their their parameters or their the objects that the actions uh, are adding to. So um, the problem here for them is that uh, identifying these uh, action name as our parameters are the different, different the difficult part, and then doing uh, orbiting on them is also difficult. Indeed, uh, when they measure their accuracies, they don't take into account order in any, in any point. So now, given that these models, in particular, in particular, these ones uh, that go from uh, encoders to uh, LSTMs, they use any kind of uh, a different type of, of, of um, models here. Um, how will this compare to our to the GPT-3 in this case, this general purpose language model? And uh, that's the, the basic idea that I want to show here. Um, so the idea is that GPT-3, as I mentioned, is a, is a transformer model that trains on billions and billions of, of tokens uh, from the web coming from uh, uh, crawl data and uh, Wikipedia. And all. So we focus, and there are several versions of GPT-3, but we focus here on the four most powerful ones, uh, the one with most parameters being uh, with 135 billion parameters. Finally, we also, um, at the very bottom, we also show the hyperparameters that we are using for GPT-3 in, um, in order to fix or to make sure that there is reproducibility of the, of the experiments. So then the idea is that now, given that GPT-3, uh, GPT-3 works by prompting. So you can give a, a text, for example, and without even just by giving an example, it will learn or it will know what to do next. So um, the idea is that now the, we can give just a simple thing as uh, this from where with text from here to the end of here uh, as an example, and then just prompt it with the next example that we want to, or the, or the next uh, shot that we want to have. And GPT-3 will automatically understand that what it has to do is similar to the task at, at the top and will just extract automatically the the, the actions. Uh, this is this. Uh, it is worth noting that it doesn't need any retraining and any refining. It only needs just few short examples. Uh, in this case, just one short example is enough. Um, so now we measure. What I do is we we measure in order. Uh, we measure uh, performance. Uh, we do so with uh, the same uh, metrics that they use in the state of the art, which is F1, with precision and recall. And we do so, we also do so in, uh, with the data sets of uh, Windows Help and Super Cooking Tutorial and Wiki Help on Common Garden. And the results that we show are basically, um, so at the bottom, we can see here how, uh, what these are the four types of GPT-3 models that we are using. Um, and we can see that it, can comparably do well for the for cases where in this case it's Windows Windows Help and Super Dataset. It can do comparably well, competitively well, even surpassing some of the task specific models. Um, uh, but probably we I hypothesize that it's because uh, the data set itself is very simple. For more complex data sets, you can see that the that the accuracy drops more even though, although it's really not uh, random, it's really better, much better than random access. So uh, it's worth noting that. Then uh, I also measure the, the amount of how, for, for every of the um, types of GPT-3, the amount of one shot to four shot examples that you can give and how that changes the accuracy and uh, or the F1 score. And I, I, we show that uh, indeed for, for two or three short examples, that's already enough uh, for getting the, the highest uh, the highest accuracy. Finally, I also want to note that um, given three also show to understand some sort or some notion of, 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 of temporal uh, understanding from the, from the text. So when you use like before, things like before or after, um, it understood that, uh, that uh, the action that it was going to extract, one of them was going to be before the other, and uh, it uh, did, did so in the, as the, with the generation. 
So yeah, uh, some of the takeaways basically that for, for smaller data sets, simpler data sets can already do very good. Uh, and then it can capture this temporal relationship. Now the uh, GBDT is also not um, <clears throat> not less prone to failure modes in this case, as I show here a quick example where I both give uh, same prompt only changed by one small symbol here, and it completely changes the whole thing of uh, the whole output of GBDT. So this gives us already the sense that it's no different from any other pattern matching neural network, so as to say, and uh, it is no more safe to this unexpected mode that can happen. So it's not, there is really not much reasoning that seems to be given, given right now. Uh, and then so further analysis on this uh, reasoning capabilities are nice to do. And this is, this brings me to my second part of this uh, work where uh, we analyze um, different, uh, for different planning tasks. tasks. Um, we give different planning tasks that are um, reasoning tasks. For example, give a, give a plan, uh, you, you give an initial uh, state, uh, goal state and uh, expect and a domain to, uh, to uh, GPT-3 and expect to get a plan. That's for example, task one. That uh, up to, um, Pre planning or even making making sure checking if the if the if the GBT three is making cost of you know, these are the tasks that we that we measure. An example, uh, just a quick example of this. Uh, so for for the plan generation side, for example, you can give a prompt like this uh, and expect uh, uh, GBT three to give you uh, um, the the plan itself. It gives you the plan. We measure. Uh, if the plan is actually valid and, and optimal. And then other cases where we just switch some of the, we, what, you, what we do is just switching some of the, some of the, uh, some of the blocks, for example, in this case, or, or the ordering, uh, and, and expect that GB3 would understand that there is, there is no importance in this chain, for example. Um, in order to do that, we also, uh, develop like an architecture, a system architecture that uh, is openly available. It's also, uh, um, it also is not, it's, it's not dependent. This, there are two, com two components mostly. The one that is dependent on the, on the LLM. The other one is independent on the LLM that we're using. And in this sense, uh, it can be extended to any LLM. So we use uh, several, uh, uh, several uh, blocks uh, components of, of information here that uh, some of that well um, that uh, depending on the on the LLM will be dependent you know, on the left side for example and independent for for the other blocks. Um, finally, also we what we do is uh, uh, evaluate um, do a baseline evaluation of on humans to see how well they can actually perform into making. Uh, uh, plans themselves we do so by gathering one out of 500 possible uh, plan uh, problems uh, and fixing the domain we make them create the whole plan first by hand and then by matching the the whatever they have done by hand to an existing action set that they have, we provide to them and then we show that from these 50 humans 39 of them can come up with a valid plan while 30, 35 even do so uh, in the, uh, with, with an optimal plan. So this brings me to the results in this case for, for this uh, project where in general, we can see that they are still, we also evaluate Lumas uh, as well, it's another uh, LLM. And we can see that in general, they are still a long way to go in terms of um, doing, uh, performing these reasoning tasks uh, more optimally or, or closer to a human baseline, especially after seeing that uh, humans can get up to like 78% or even for, for planning or optimal planning up to 89.7%. Uh, um, they are still a long way to go. We hypothesize that probably the, the idea uh, and them performing better at the uh, goal reformulation tasks well, uh, it's because um, um, 
they are simpler tasks where just we just move some of the of the things from the, the instance and just ask for this kind of very very similar instance later. So it is a much simpler task than the than the others. Um, yeah. The, now um, as a final remark, uh, this this work was. Uh, I wanted just to overall comment about it. Um, I was uh, happy to do it with, I don't know if Sharad is here, but I hope he doesn't cringe too much. Oh yes, he is, okay. Yeah, hopefully he doesn't cringe too much when I explain his work, that I work with him and I was at the pleasure to work with him. Um, this call, this work is called uh, Model Free Model Reconciliation. And the idea quickly, the idea summarized here was that um, you, have a, you have a setting where you are trying to model the human, uh, the human model, the human mental model of a task, and that at the same time that the that the robot itself, um, at the same time of the robot itself is also in that task as well. So you have the model of the human, sorry, model of the robot and the model of the of the human in the, in the robots. Uh, sorry, the model of the human in the robot. So. There may be some differences between them, and previously the state of the art was the, what they did was just um, reconcile these 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 uh, these differences by giving explanations. These uh, these two models also are like fixed, and they have to be provided. That was one of the caveats of using this method. So in this new work, uh, what they do, what we do, is to uh, assume that we don't have the model of the human, and then. Um, learn a labeling function that comes from the trajectories that we give to the human and some the explainability uh, messages, some, exp uh, some, some messages as the explanations. And then the, now the reconciliation is done uh, by means of model updates, which, in, which now we have also switched towards M an MDP, more of an MDP setting, while before it was more of a, a PDDL or, or a FIP setting. Uh, which was more fixed. So in terms of the evaluations that we did here, were mostly over three main domains, uh, RL domains, the uh, taxi for rooms and warehouse domains. All of them seem to, or that's the, the way that, uh, sorry, those are the accuracy or the model that we learned from the, the, the labeling, labeling the human. And, and we see that it works over like 80% of most of the times. It has an accuracy of over 80%. And finally, for the case of the, we also make a new case where we test with actual humans, where they provide us with the, the, with the traces that they consider explicable and inexplicable. And we train another model and uh, also achieve very high accuracy with around 95%. Okay. And with this, I want to conclude with a very quick um, conclusion and takeaways um, uh, slide, where basically this work has been mostly focused on this, as I mentioned, uh, seeing how, analyzing how these large learned models or these large neural networks uh, operate, more on the proactive side by trying, trying to even improve them uh, with our, for the large image classifier side, where we retrain uh, the, the actual uh, classifier itself, and then more probing towards the, uh, for generative upper cell networks and LLMs. Uh, so the takeaways here, if you are using a large image classifier, and feel, um, um, and you can you happen to know the mental model of the human, you can extract it from, even from knowledge bases, um, and if you can incorporate it in the, in the training itself of the or retraining of the classifier that would be that would be uh, a good thing to do uh, for the other two always be um, careful of the of your data of your data and expect expect the that failure modes and and biases can be uh, exacerbated if you are used them, using them for data augmentation techniques for example <laughs> and yeah um, apart from that so my research contributions have been this over the, the time. Uh, I want to also, before I finish, I want to well, thank you, uh, the committee members, Charlie, uh, and Juan Lu, and Professor Rao, always, for, for putting up with me all these years, basically. 
Um, I also want to thank all my, my lab mates from Shara, Shiram, uh, Nikhalika, who is also here, Sachin, uh, Sara, Moody, uh, Utka, Selene, all of you. <laughs> and then Karthi, uh, Kanaga, uh, 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 Divyas, Dan, uh, well, uh, Dennis, and, and Matthew. And I also had the pleasure of working with, uh, at some point in time, with Tatagata, which, has, which also was a, a pleasure, and I wanted to mention him here. And also, of course, very importantly, the robots in our lab, which are also already, um, <laughs> uh, it's, it's very, I need to mention that. So, uh, yeah. So with that in mind, thank you, Jantian, as well. He was also part of some of my work, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I just want to thank all of you, basically, for all this time. Uh, and I'll leave it uh, here in this, in this conclusion table uh, for any questions that you have. So uh, we have time for questions. Uh, I'm happy I can tell anybody in the whole session is bad because some shy is like doing it. No, no, he doesn't look. We do all the best. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and ask questions. Yeah. Yes. So in the final what's your intuition about it does so better when they are closer. First off, if they are simpler, that's much better for, for GPT-3. At least for the structure, representation uh, work that I did, it's, it works much better when the, when the domain is very simple. Um, but it showed anyways, it, it did show, it did show a certain understanding for others like the, the squeaky home and garden uh, as well. Um, yeah, I would say they are, it is still not, ready uh, for these more complex domains. It is still not ready for that, but uh, it can still, like, you don't need to retrain, you don't need to do anything, just to, by prompting, you can get the, so it's still worth at least giving a try for some of the, yeah. Yeah, yeah, So it, it may have its own learn, we learn basically from, from all the, the, the data that is, has been to train. Um, but by giving the, our own, it's, it's, I don't think it's, it's like a stateless. Once you, once you change the, the session, I, it's over. So it can only do um, with the shot, the few shot learning that you, few shot, approach, few shot um, examples that you give. So I don't think it gets enough to, to learn like the, the model itself, unless it were it had it previously. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. Given that if they are like more grounded, at least that's something. If so long, the problem with this, um, at least these large learning models, is that you don't know exactly where they are getting all their biases from, for example. So, getting some kind of symb symbolic. Uh, representations first, at least you can tackle exactly where you are being moving to. So I would say uh, I don't have expertise enough to tell you like an exact uh, uh, solution to that, but definitely if you have more con a more control uh, symbolic version of that, uh, it can definitely, it should be better than just using the DBD3 or the large learn model and just um, randomly see if, if it's actually biased or, or not, for example. Or the outputs are uh, biased. Or, yeah. yeah, yeah, of course. Thank you. Uh, 
Okay. Yeah, I, I had a quick question. So there's a, a sort of recent paper which got accepted to New Rips uh, by Jason Wise Group at Google, at Google, which is called, I think, Chain of Thought Elicits Reasoning in Large Language Models. And they sort of also have a benchmark, which is, uh, which I think is called, let me try to find that. I think it's called uh, Say Can Robot Planning. Uh, and that also has things like find, pick up, drop, and stuff like that. So the, the main hypothesis in the paper is if you give, say, around five to eight examples where you write in English, for example, say, if you want the robot to have a plan to uh, find some chips and bring it to you, you give one sentence which says that uh, the user is hungry and asks for chips. There are several types of chips available, I, but he prefers kettle chips, so I'll bring him kettle chips. And then you give the plan. So basically you give an English sentence that sort of elicits what the reasoning is, and then you give a plan. And just by doing this, they showed that even for GPT-175 billion, and since this is Google, they also had a Palm 540 billion, that you can just improve uh, like the results on these, at least this planning domain drastically. Just wanted to see if you had tried this at all. So for this case, we did, I believe we did try by uh, not in this setup in, in Google, thank you also for pointing it out, but we did try, for example, I believe by adding this new set, saying of um, less thing step by step, I think that's something we, we try, which is also one of the in one of the more research papers, where okay. it makes the like the, the model try to try to, to think more thoroughly, but uh, we couldn't find any uh, better uh, uh, improvements like that. But oh, okay, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll forward you this paper. You might yeah. want to take a look as well. Like they, they just do the simple thing and they got accepted to do rip. So, so I'm guessing there is something there where you will want to check it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Then, um, thank you for the uh, participation. Uh, we now going to have the and also on the Zoom, uh, everybody other than the community. Oh, yeah, I was this should come out. Yeah, I will, I will take them. Out. Oh, should I also stop the recording? Yes. Okay. So I'm not sure how. Oh, okay. Sorry, that's my father. <laughs> oh, no, I didn't. Wonderful. Can you remove that for that? Oh, I see. That's what the. Yeah, I, like, I want to remove them. Yeah, because I don't understand English either. So. Um, and then uh, I think there's someone else. Oh, Ashin, Shalik, I think we're all. And then let me stop the recording as well. So, uh, Alberto, I have a, 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 a yeah. simple question for you, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, if I understand it correctly, so your uh, the first piece of work about this uh, image classification explainability, there you may mainly rely on the word net to 